Ashley Wadsworth didn't have a smartphone when she was 12 years old. With a close-knit group of family and friends in Vernon, a tiny city in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, her mother reasoned that she didn't need one. She did, however, utilize the family laptop to check out the social media updates that her buddies were making. Her peers didn't think it was brazen to message a gorgeous stranger to say hello or add friends of friends on a whim. In the same manner that older generations would have done at the mall, Wadsworth and her friends interacted confidently online. In 2015, after discovering Jack Seppel, a 16-year-old English adolescent, on the profile of a mutual acquaintance, Wadsworth added him as a friend on Facebook. Wadsworth had always been interested in the larger world, and Seppel provided a window into far-off locales, even if those locales were limited to Chelmsford in Essex, which is an hour northeast of London and home to around 180,000 people. Wadsworth was intelligent and outgoing. She enjoyed playing tennis, clarinet, and ringette. She made a special effort to make friends with overseas kids at school since she knew they might feel lonely being so far from home. Seppel, on the other hand, was reserved. Wadsworth admired his independent charm despite his lackluster social life and seeming obsession with social media. <laughs> no way I'm sending this. We had so much fun growing up. We did so many adventurous, outdoorsy things. Hi, hard driving. <laughs> Teen, she loved social media. She would make TikToks. So I'd go in her room and she'd be like, Mom! It's a video. <laughs> funny. The distance between them and the fact that Seppel also resided at home with his family helped to narrow their three-and-a-half-year age gap. In the beginning, the two acted more like pen pals and confidants whose regular correspondence changed the scenery in one another's life. Ashley first met Jack, as I understand it, on the Facebook. So they were just friends at first. It was... Um, yeah, and then they would talk about Britain, and he'd ask about Canada, and they were young. She must have been about, let's say, 11 or 12. If she was talking to him, I'd be like, oh, hi, Jack, and I'd ask him about England, and loved his accent. <laughs> so I'd always say, I love your accent. I just thought he was in Within a few months, Wadsworth started telling Christy Gendron, her mother, Haley, her sister, and her father, Kenneth, who lived close by with his wife, about Seppel. Gendron was wary about the developing relationship, but as Seppel shared pictures of himself, he relaxed. They appeared to support his claim that he was the bored youngster who, like many others in his generation, spent much of his time online socializing. Although Gendron anticipated that the attraction would wane, the two became more than just confidants. Wadsworth received gifts from Seppel included clothing, cash, teddy bears, jewelry, and a handbag. She thought he was a nice guy, buyer stuff and random stuff. He'd just send it over. So she thought she was she thought he was really nice. I just thought it was a little strange that a man that's like four years older than her is like buying her stuff and sending it from England. They communicated intermittently and then became silent for a while. Due to the eight-hour time difference, Wadsworth woke up early in the morning to talk to Seppel, who stayed up late into the night on his end. When they were on, Seppel's face became a regular presence in the Wadsworth household. Gendron might look up from cooking dinner to see him on a screen and offer a warm hi, Jack. Tiana Kowalchuk, a close friend of Wadsworth's, claims that she had this connection with him that nobody understood. Their lengthy discussions always centered on the same pipe dream, that they would eventually meet. Wadsworth began requesting permission to visit Seppel from her mother in 2018. Going there under, under my roof, uh, she had asked me, and I said, uh, no, you're too young, and when you're an adult, if you're still talking, I can't stop you. Naturally, the response was no, as she was just 15 at the time. As in every teenage relationship, there were times when the two got into arguments, which were typically centered around Seppel's worries that Wadsworth had crushes on young men in Vernon. 
When the tension reached a breaking point, Wadsworth would restrict Seppel from his social media accounts. To grab her attention, he would then create new accounts or send irate messages to her sister and friends. Seppel's admiration appeared to some of Wadsworth's friends to be an obsession. She was adamant that he was just a passionate individual with a decent heart. When Wadsworth was 16 years old and Seppel was almost 20, he unveiled a new tattoo in October 2018 as a symbol of his devotion, Wadsworth's initial name, tattooed on his arm in intricate cursive. Gendron deemed it excessive and warned her daughter that she was not permitted to respond with her own. She answered, Mom, I would never. Despite her growing infatuation, Wadsworth led a fulfilling life away from her boyfriend. She enjoyed going on hikes and camping trips with friends, as well as dirty off-roading excursions with Kowalczak. She shared videos on Snapchat with amusing filters, such as a halo of love around her head, while bopping along to the radio in the car. Another, from when she was 15 years old, features her singing the lyrics to Hallelujah, while zooming in and forth on her blue eyes and long eyelashes and making a funny lip purr as she acknowledges she dropped a note. She and Kowalczuk sold raffle tickets at nearby grocery stores, selling every single one to collect money for their high school graduation. In pictures from the event in June 2020, Wadsworth and her family can be seen beaming while holding a bouquet of congratulations flowers in their arms. Some people started to perceive Seppel's devotion as obsession. Wadsworth maintained that he was just a passionate individual. Her relationship with Seppel was also becoming more turbulent at the time. Wadsworth started to keep some of it hidden from her mother, but not entirely from her friends. Angry after one of their arguments in 2018, Seppel dragged a knife across the name Wadsworth he had inked on his body. She thought it was messed up, Kowalczuk says. Although Seppel was intensely jealous that Wadsworth could be meeting lads in Vernon, the truth was that he was dating ladies in Chelmsford. It was his deranged way of professing his love to her. Wadsworth started getting calls from several people in 2020 when she turned 18 and they were fighting with Seppel. They hoped she could calm him down because she was his favorite, as he had made obvious to them. Wadsworth once received a call while out with Kowalczuk from a woman claiming Seppel wouldn't allow her leave his residence. According to Kowalczuk, it was almost like she had seen this before. It appeared to be a common occurrence. He was ordered by her to quit being wild. In retrospect, one would wonder why Wadsworth didn't sever relations at the time. Seppel wanted to fall in love and was an expert manipulator. Wadsworth could not yet see his actions as abusive because she was still a teenager. His behavior was troubling, obviously, but there was no clear framework for explanation without a vocabulary for abuse. Wadsworth frequently ignored Kowalczuk's advice to get rid of him, instead, they always made up. They both agreed that once they could be together, everything would be ideal because of his apparent sincerity in his apology. According to Kowalczuk, he would use gifts or excuses as a way to get her back. Wadsworth had no idea how much worse things would get. Wadsworth began accruing hours at part-time jobs as soon as she was able to do so legally, including McDonald's, Burger King, Asian Avenue, Home Depot, and Red Bag, a clothes business. Her first purchase was an iPad so she could stop using the family PC. Wadsworth postponed enrolling at Thompson Rivers University in 2020. She yearned for a campus community but courses were still being held on Zoom due to the pandemic. Additionally, it was the ideal time to visit England. She had completed high school, was financially secure, and was unaffected by her parents' severe admonitions that she was still a minor. Now that she was an adult, she had complete freedom. At the age of 19, she left her family behind and boarded a flight to London with a six-month tourist visa. She was going to go to England, no matter what. Like, she always wanted to go to England. She had asked when she was 16, but that was a definite no. But as soon as she turned 19, she took the chance. I immediately said, no way. And uh, 
well, I'm going to go no matter what, so you're either with me or against me. So I said, okay, I'm with you. Start, save up your money and you go. Go have fun. I was so excited to go to England. This was a trip of a lifetime for her. He was astonished. Like, she was so excited. Like, finally got to meet the man that she's been like loving for years. I looked to said to him, you know, Jack, I said, I'm sending you my baby, so please take care of her. As she's, I'm trusting you with her. And he said, yeah, I'll guard her with my life. This was her first time traveling alone. She posted a Snapchat of herself kissing her loved ones from her airline seat. She exclaimed, I'm in my plane, as she eagerly listed the comforts of her first transatlantic voyage. It's enormous. The two were finally reunited the following day. Wadsworth updated her Facebook profile picture to show her and Seppel smiling broadly in the airport's arrivals area at London Gatwick. Wadsworth's innocent looks contrasted sharply with Seppel's rugged appearance. He had numerous tattoos, swollen eyes, and a grumpy demeanor. With her soft brown hair and a floral patterned mask pulled down to her chin, she made a delicate contrast. In the comments, loved ones and cheerful faces were left as emojis. Oh, she thought England was just beautiful. I mean, everything. This was the dream she had. They went on a few, like, little tourist trips with his mom. Wadsworth appeared satisfied after spending so many years pining. It briefly seemed like a charming love story, a rare romantic gamble that paid out. Seppel had resided in a row house in a public housing estate in northwest Chelmsford since 2020 when Wadsworth moved in. They looked at Chelmsford's more affluent neighborhoods even though the neighborhood itself has a reputation for being rough. Wadsworth shared pictures of their vacations on Facebook. In one, they are cuddling outside a church with autumn leaves scattered all around them. Their smiles are so wide that it makes their faces look rounder. Winston is the name they gave their new kitty. Wadsworth beaming when Seppel FaceTimed her family back home, he too appeared happy. Seppel resembled the man Wadsworth had known him to be throughout those years of online communication in many ways. He might be warm and adoring, often complimenting her and never declining a romantic selfie. He might also be explosive and have a bad temper. Every day, the couple spent the entire day together. Wadsworth couldn't work since he had a tourist visa, and Seppel was unemployed, relying on social assistance and occasionally his close by mother Tracy Dalton for financial support. Despite having little contact with others, he was close to her and his sister Nadia. He appeared to have no friends or social life. Suddenly, neither did Wadsworth. He didn't do anything nice for her. Her life kind of became boring, stuck in the flat that they lived in. Jack wasn't working, and I said, like, you guys just sit there all day? After a few weeks, Seppel's world began to contract even more as she began to prefer staying home, smoking pot, and playing Xbox rather than out for walks. It marked a stark contrast to Wadsworth's active home life. Seppel didn't even enjoy Wadsworth talking to the neighbors in Chelmsford. Wadsworth had developed a religious interest in her late teens while living in British Columbia and had chosen to be baptized into the local Mormon church. Wadsworth's family wasn't very religious, and even while she was never devoted, her infatuation with religion looked to be an example of restless, immature soul-searching. According to Kowalczuk, she read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover. Something inside of her clicked. 
Ashley Wadsworth, a cheerful, silly, and fun-loving adolescent, led a lively existence in a small-town British Columbia. Wadsworth was introduced to some American missionaries her age who would be in Chelmsford at the same time by a church acquaintance before she left Canada. She informed Seppel she wanted to make plans with them when Wadsworth arrived, but he didn't agree and wouldn't let her go to Sunday services. Wadsworth, though, was growing bored and lonely. She thereby established a text friendship with the missionaries in spite of their close proximity. Knowing Seppel spied on her phone, she developed the practice of wiping her WhatsApp history to prevent him from finding out. Her new companions were aware of Seppel's dominance. I can still hear myself saying, Ashley, don't you think you deserve more than that? One of his friends remembers his forbidding her from going on their road trip, another claims that in retrospect there was more going on than Ashley was telling us and that she was like, oh, I know I do, I just want to make him happy. That also involved physical abuse. Six weeks after Wadsworth's arrival, on Boxing Day, Seppel contacted his mother to claim that he had smacked Wadsworth after learning that she had long before blocked two British phone numbers. The numbers, he reasoned, belonged to other guys. Dalton wrote back, that's no excuse to touch her. His psychiatric issues were more pervasive than Wadsworth had realized, and this became increasingly clear. She was aware of Seppel's history of self-harming. When he was upset or needed comfort from his girlfriends, he would slash himself, never badly injuring himself, but just deeply enough to bleed. Additionally, he consistently used an anti-anxiety drug. Wadsworth was driven to remain by his side. The day following Boxing Day, she updated her profile image on Facebook to a photograph of Seppel holding her close while they both grinned, adding the caption my bestie and a red heart. At about the same time, she started recording her bruises in a private Snapchat folder. Wadsworth didn't keep the abuse from her sister, but he did threaten to stop talking to Haley if she revealed it to their mother. Haley explains, she didn't want us to despise him. Seppel made an attempt at suicide in late December 2021 by ingesting a quantity of his anti-anxiety medicine. Wadsworth phoned an ambulance, which hurried him to the hospital to receive overdose treatment. Wadsworth was chosen as his carer and given the responsibility of carefully providing his medication. A nurse provided her a lockbox to keep the tablets in. Wadsworth kept the information from her mother and others, but Haley revealed it. Gendron, who was concerned, advised Wadsworth to return home. Wadsworth was adamant that he would improve. Early in January, Seppel hit Wadsworth over the head with a large beer cup made of thick glass. As Seppel ordered her sweep up the fragments, Wadsworth FaceTimed her sister while sobbing. Seppel was pacing back and forth in the background while yelling and gritting his teeth. Haley unsuccessfully begged her sister to take a about a week later, they got another altercation where she FaceTimed me and he had started throwing objects at her while we were on FaceTime. And then that's when I kind of said, like, I'm going to kind of let mom know, like, it's not going the greatest. Flight home. After Seppel's suicide attempt, Tracy Dalton, Seppel's mother, and her husband Ricky planned a family vacation to Rye, a tiny coastal village. Seppel's psychological problems were hidden from bystanders, who would have seen a happy family strolling cobblestone roads, ordering dessert, and posing for pictures with their arms around each other. They ate in pubs and traveled through the picturesque English countryside. Gendron was happy to see her daughter's images because perhaps things had changed for the better. The reset didn't last long. Soon after getting home, Seppel became enraged when he saw texts from a young Canadian man that he imagined Wadsworth was interested in that were several years old on her phone. She complied when he asked for her social media passwords. At the end of January, while on FaceTime with Haley, who was pleading with her sister to come home, Seppel assaulted Wadsworth once more and threw a candle and a television remote at her. Wadsworth initially consented, but quickly changed his mind since she thought the charming lad she had gotten up early to talk to all those years before was still inside the monstrous version of him. 
She hoped that healing would come to him through time, medicine, or her love. Wadsworth had been subjected to a vicious loop in which Seppel had accused her of betraying him, assaulted her, apologized, and then repeated the pattern. He wrote on Boxing Day to his mother, she's the only person I've ever truly loved. On January 29, he texted his mother to tell her that Wadsworth should return home, saying, but I'm ruining it and it's killing me inside. Running away is not the answer, Dalton retorted. She said, if you want her to go, I understand, but added that relationships are hard work and it takes effort, patience, and love to stay together. Wadsworth changed her Facebook profile picture to a picture of her and Seppel smiling on a sunny day on January 30th. Seppel wrote to his sister that evening, saying, I'm obsessed with Ashley's past. At London Gatwick Airport in November 2021, shortly after Seppel's arrival in England on February 1st, Seppel was irate once more. He had looked through her phone because, despite keeping a watchful eye on her every move, he was still convinced that Wadsworth may be sneaking up on him. Helen Bertenshaw, the couple's next-door neighbor, overheard Wadsworth screaming through their common wall just before 8 a. m. A short while later, Wadsworth showed up barefoot at her door. I said, look, we've got to phone the police. And um, she said, no, not for a minute. And she said, and then he threw the kitten against the wall. And I said, we've got to phone the police. When the elderly woman opened it, Wadsworth was sobbing and blood was gushing from a cut on her palm. She said Seppel hit her, breaking her phone. Their kitten was flung against the wall by him. She feared he might kill her, but asked Bertensha not to contact the police out of concern that he may damage himself if things got out of hand or out of concern that he'd end himself in jail. Bertenshaw consented, but requested that Wadsworth stay at her house rather than accompany her to a doctor's visit she scheduled that morning. Wadsworth declined, so Bertenshaw went to the neighboring house alone herself to talk sense into Seppel. After his apology, she walked out. Another neighbor, Lucy, sent a parcel to Seppel's address by error at around 9 a.m. Lucy didn't think much of Seppel's refusal to fully open the door because she was aware of his gloomy demeanor and tendency to come off as paranoid. Wadsworth made a midnight phone call to her family in Vernon at that time using Seppel's phone. She stated that she wished to return home. Because Haley had finally divulged the information to Gendron, she was afraid. The Wadsworths immediately made a reservation on a flight leaving in two days. Seppel consented to drive Wadsworth to the airport after the COVID pre-flight exam. If Seppel blew out again, Gendron instructed her daughter to leave and head straight for the airport, and she warned Seppel that she would call the police if he injured Wadsworth any further. Unrelatedly, Haley messaged Seppel's mother, who replied that she couldn't help because she was already at the airport. It was around 3 a.m. when Wadsworth and her family parted for the final time, and she told Haley, as soon as Ashley leaves he's gonna kill himself. 11 a.m. in Chelmsford, Vernon. Gendron now thinks Seppel made the decision to kill her daughter at this point. After a short while, Seppel sent his mother a WhatsApp message saying, I beat up Ashley pretty bad. Dalton replied, Is she hurt? John, why? He replied, she thinks she broke her arm, 14 minutes later. As the prosecution read aloud Seppel's extensive history of violence, the Wadsworths watched in startled silence. Between 11.22 a.m. Wadsworth used Seppel's phone to send frantic texts to her family and friends in Vernon, where it was the middle of the night, as well as to her church acquaintances in Chelmsford, up until 12.38 p.m. The last thing I got from her was at 3.30 a.m. our time. Got morning our time. Right away, I started messaging. I've called, at this point, I've called, I don't know, 19 times I've called Jack's phone. Like, something's off. So I, I feel like I knew. I knew something was wrong. To one of her friends, she wrote, It's Ashley. I need your assistance. It is a crisis. 
She also emailed Jamie, a 20-year-old Mormon who was in Chelmsford on a missionary trip, with identical requests. Nobody got them till several hours later. Seppel killed Wadsworth at some point between 12.38 and 12.45 p.m. He then returned to the bedroom after choosing an 11.5-centimeter knife in the kitchen. At least 90 stab wounds to her chest and abdomen were inflicted by him. As soon as Wadsworth's family in Vernon awoke, they noticed the onslaught of texts that had rung their phones and hurried to get in touch. In an effort to get Wadsworth to a safe place, they called Jamie and asked her to come over. She came so along with another friend and two church members. No response was given. Following a police call, they departed. Essex, please, what's your emergency? Hi, we, one of our friends um, has been texting us that she's been in a domestic, that, like, they've had some abuse in her home. Um, okay, and is this happening now, yeah? Yeah. What's your friend's name? Ashley Wadsworth. Her age? She's 19. Yeah, she's 19. In Vernon, Kowalchuk saw that the Facebook account Wadsworth had used to contact her was still active. It turned out that Seppel, posing as Wadsworth, was messaging some of Wadsworth's other acquaintances, claiming that she had just required help locating a COVID exam and was no longer in need of aid. Kowalchuk continued to message, hoping for a response. Seppel ignored her and the messages from the Wadsworths as he went about his day. He may have played video games, according to blood later discovered on an Xbox controller by investigators. Later that day, he updated his Facebook profile image to a picture of him and Ashley taken at Gabwick months previously and added the text forever mine. In the bedroom, he made a video message for Wadsworth's sister that he never delivered. He was gasping heavily as Wadsworth's body could be seen in the background when he said he loved her and was sorry. In reference to her body, he said, couldn't ever let you leave. My head was messed up, Haley. I'm very sorry for taking your sister. His slight, superficial chest wounds after finishing the movie appear to have been caused by self-defense preparation, according to the prosecution. Before the cops arrived, Seppel had one more conversation with his sister. They had a video chat around four o'clock. He continued, Nadia, I've killed Ashley, and pointed the phone's camera at Wadsworth's corpse. When two police officers stormed in the front door after being called by Jamie ten minutes earlier, the call came to an end. Open the door! I know you're in there, I've just seen you. You need to open the door or it's going to come in. Mate, open the door! you got five seconds, otherwise we're kicking it in. Right, we're going to kick the door in! Come out. Officers on the scene characterized Seppel as being composed. Seppel was sent to Chelmsford Prison after the murder. He then claimed he was high at the time of the murder in a jumbled, nonsensical statement scrawled on the front and back of a list of facility rules. When he was arrested, he told police he'd gone psychotic, but toxicology reports found only cannabis and a therapeutic dose of his anti-anxiety medication in his system, and a psychiatric assessment determined he was fit to plead and stand trial. He pleaded guilty in September 2022 after the evidence, which included his videotaped confession, was overwhelmingly against him. In October, a sentence hearing was expected. Gendron and Dalton communicated up until the deadline for sentencing. Wadsworth's mother was aware that Dalton was also struggling with a type of grief as a result of the gravity of her son's crime. She also showed kindness toward their daughter, telling her via video chat that she couldn't wait for her to arrive in Chelmsford and that she had already purchased a teacup, robe, and slippers for her. When the Wadsworths arrived in Chelmsford for the sentencing hearing, the two intended to meet in person. As of October 10, 2022, that has changed. 
The Wadsworths watched in stunned silence as prosecuting attorney Simon Spence read aloud a list of violent acts, domineering behavior, harassment, and frightful outbursts from Seppel's lengthy criminal history at Chelmsford Crown Court, which was jam-packed with journalists and onlookers. Seppel first connected with the girl online while he was only 15 years old in 2014. When she ended their relationship, he secretly took naked pictures of the girl, hacked into her Facebook account, and posted the pictures for everyone to see. A restraining order was filed by her. He disobeyed the ruling a month later by asking to follow the victim on Instagram. The same year, Seppel and his mother got into a fight about his Xbox, pushed her to the ground, and then Seppel tore a door from its hinges. He again violated the restraining order in March of the following year by submitting another Instagram request. Seppel didn't wait more than six minutes to get in touch with the victim after the 2017 restraining order was lifted. He made an effort to contact the victim through her acquaintances, just like he did with Wadsworth. The message stated, Please reply, you are never going to get rid of me, even if I have to go to prison over you, and he sent it to her in January of the next year. He completed a sentence of suspended detention. I'll see you soon, and I will turn up wherever you live. Seppel sliced his arm in July of 2018 and his mother phoned an ambulance. He once more vandalized a door at her house out of rage at her for calling the paramedics. A restraining order was requested by the court on behalf of Dalton, and he was given a term of eight weeks in a young offender facility. He created a new Instagram account to get in touch with his victim after she banned him in September, which was another violation of the restraining order and led to a detention sentence. He admitted trying to break into a supported living facility the following month and was given a 21-day sentence. Seppel met a woman on Facebook in March of 2020. When she tried to break up with him, he wrapped his hand around her throat and locked her inside the house, but she eventually found him to be jealous and unpredictable. He pounded her with calls and texts after she fled through a window. He had previously kept another woman in his house for several months. Due to this, Seppel was accused of coercive or controlling behavior, common assault, and wrongful detention. He couldn't be found guilty since the victim failed to appear at the trial hearing to present evidence, but a non-conviction restraining order was still filed, increasing his total number of restraining orders to three. Although Seppel's violent criminal record was well documented by the courts and police, there was more. I was shown a picture by another ex-girlfriend of Seppel holding a knife to his own throat and letting blood fall from a shallow incision, which he had emailed to her sometime in 2018. During their relationship, according to the woman, Seppel freely pondered what it would be like to kill someone. The following text message simply stated, I am sad. She claims he could be charming, but he broke two of her phones and allegedly threatened to stab her. A former middle school classmate of Seppel's informed me that Seppel frequently got into trouble for throwing tables and acting aggressively in general. Seppel had a dark side that was visible even as a young child, according to a former classmate who attended elementary school with him. The two drifted apart as Seppel attended CSS Haybridge, a school for at-risk students who struggle in traditional settings. He had a lot of love to give, he says, but he was very quick to snap or lose his head. Once, when the friend beat Seppel in a video game, Seppel ran to the kitchen and started slicing his wrists, his mother had to wrestle the knife from him. According to a former teacher, Seppel was intimidating, particularly around female staff members. But, the teacher said, he might also be charming. When does someone who has been proven to be violent lose their right to remain anonymous? Why does a history of violence need to be concealed? Seppel was given a life sentence and must serve a minimum of 23 and a half years before being eligible for parole. Wadsworth's mother claims that even his apology was manipulative, her father read it, then let his copy fall from his hands, leaving it on the courtroom table. Seppel sent a letter of apology to Wadsworth's family through lawyers, which included the statement, It's no excuse, but I know my intrusive thoughts have a big effect on my thinking and my actions. 
The Wadsworths can't stop rehearsing scenarios in their heads as sentence approaches, most agonizingly, what if they or their daughter had been aware of Seppel's extensive history? Seppel's estranged brother called him a sick, twisted, evil individual in a letter to the Wadsworth family that was delivered following the murder. Gendron doesn't accuse Seppel's family, but he does wonder why they kept quiet while their kid was being protected. Gendron adds of Seppel's mother, she didn't take the knife and kill Ashley. I am aware of that. She probably didn't believe he would kill her. However, if your child exhibits violent behavior in their relationship or has mental health difficulties, intervene. More direct inquiries are made by Wadsworth's father, such as when an aggressor ceases to be anonymous. Why do privacy rules shield people's secrets when openness can save lives? Before their daughter traveled to England, the Wadsworths googled Seppel. Nothing appeared. I realize that intrudes on privacy, he admits. But maybe you shouldn't have that right if you're a violent serial offender. Ashley's parents, Christy Gendron and Kenneth Wadsworth Christy Gendron, the mother of Ashley Wadsworth, and Kenneth Wadsworth were present at the sentencing hearing for Jack Seppel. In order to address this, Claire's Law, a domestic violence disclosure scheme in the United Kingdom, allows police to share the criminal histories of convicted abusers when they believe potential victims are in danger. The statute is named for Claire Wood, an Englishwoman who was killed by her abusive spouse in 2009. Police were aware of his violent tendencies because he had previously served time for harassment and holding a woman at knife point. Both the right to ask and the right to know are possible under Claire's law. Theoretically, Claire's law fosters the kind of openness that could keep someone like Wadsworth from joining a potentially harmful relationship. In actuality, it is more difficult. In England, 375 out of 1,609 right-to-ask responses took longer than 35 days, according to a 2021 Guardian story. The number of requests significantly increased from 2018 to 2020, from 3,479 to 8,438. This caused additional delays. According to the same Guardian article, only 36 out of 529 Claire's Law requests were allowed in 2020 by Essex Police, the force in charge of Chelmsford. According to Wadsworth's mother, if she had known about it before her daughter left Canada, she would have filed a request because, by British law, anyone can access information. Because she loved him, Ashley might not have applied herself, but Gendron thinks he would have if he had known. Only two provinces in Canada, Alberta and Saskatchewan, have Claire's law in effect, and both have had trouble delivering information on time. As of last year, some Alberta applicants had been waiting more than three months for information, despite the fact that the province's Justice Ministry announced in June that it had finally cleared a backlog of 180 requests, approving 75% of them. The legislation was approved by the House of Assembly in Newfoundland and Labrador in 2019. Regulations are now being prepared following numerous delays, and it is anticipated to be proclaimed this summer. Claire's law was first suggested by Ontario MPP Jenny Stevens in a private member's bill in 2021, however a motion has just been presented. Privacy laws are the primary barrier. Up until 2021, police could not reveal criminal histories without the consent of the offender. The RCMP revised its rules following discussions with the federal government and Canada's privacy commissioner. In provinces where Claire's law has been passed and proclaimed, the RCMP and any municipal or other force in Canada can now share records without breaking the Privacy Act. Many would still find it difficult to escape abuse, even with Claire's law. However, some candidates might, and this is crucial, as it might prevent them from initially strengthening their ties with abusers. Given that rates of intimate partner violence against women have been rising in Canada for almost a decade and have risen by almost 20% since 2014, this would be a crucial intervention. One woman or child is killed every 48 hours in Canada, according to the Canadian Femicide Observatory for Justice and Accountability, which found that the number of women and girls killed by male accused increased by 27% in 2022 compared to 2019. 
According to Andrea Silverstone, CEO of Calgary-based survivor advocacy group suggests, Canada has failed to address domestic violence. When a partner departs or is about to go, the probability of domestic homicide is at its peak. Judge Edward Murray ruled in court that Seppel's intention to kill Wadsworth was motivated by his impending loss of power over her. Claire's law's disclosures could assist victims in creating a safe exit strategy, a process that frequently needs patience, planning, and support. Even to Wadsworth, some of the warning indications of Seppel's aggressiveness were obvious. Seppel recorded a 26-second voice message for her in March 2021, eight months before Wadsworth departed for college. He was upset because he was aware Kowalczyk had been complaining about him. He comes across as crazy in the video. He declares, I'm going to kill her, alluding to Kowalczyk, amid a stream of horrific guttural yowls. Wadsworth continued to travel to Chelmsford while threatening to murder the woman. Lawyer Pamela Cross, a legal expert on violence against women, claims that women are socialized to think we are the fixers, the peacemakers. Wadsworth was a helper, for sure. She firmly thought that everything could be healed by love, including Seppel. Jamie, the teenage missionary who called the police to Seppel's house, claims that Seppel was very committed to Jesus Christ, hope, and love. Ashley desired to have that in her life. She sneaked out while Seppel wasn't at home a few days before Wadsworth was slain and met Jamie and another friend in Melbourne Park, which was about a ten-minute walk away. The early afternoon was serene. They were talking while sitting at a picnic table when one of the only persons who were passing by stopped to pet a dog. The verse 2 Nephi 31 which states that ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope, and a love of God and of all men, was chosen by Jamie because she felt something was off. Wadsworth studied Seppel's face closely for seven years, through phones and computer screens, at the airport when they eventually met, every day of their brief relationship, and in the final moments of her life. The word hope in cursive lettering had been tattooed under his right eye for a while. It was the moral foundation she clung to and it stared back at her as if to say that the ideal light will come. The Wadsworths visited the row house where their daughter had resided with Seppel after the sentence. In the windows they peered. When she passed away, they placed flowers close to where they had taken her to the lawn. They created a garden there, allowing brilliant blooms to contrast repulsive recollections. As soon as Gendron got back to Vernon, Haley and she headed to Wadsworth's grave. They brought Haley's little child, who excitedly set up her new double-decker bus toy for her aunt to see. According to Haley, her sister receives signs from above. In the mirror, she occasionally recognizes herself. The family's home has doors that appear to open and shut on their own. Lights automatically come on and go off. The family's property is constantly covered in white, fluffy feathers. Dragonflies and birds are present. When Kowalczyk got married in August of last year, Haley filled in for her sister as a bridesmaid. A butterfly landed on the flowers as the sun was setting. Haley claims Ashley was it without a doubt. Haley declares, I think she's there. And beyond this life, we will be with her forever.